Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. Thanks so much for coming. I am today with one of my friends, David Safir of Cash is Clear. He is a financial professional, and I'm super excited for the conversation because I know um, not only is he a financial professional, but he helps others grow uh, what we call cash flow. And I know that from our conversations that it's been really helpful for me to bring into this home some habits and strategies around managing your cash and just making it, just making sort of the ease of your life and the ease of the running of your household just that much better. So uh, David, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay. It's good to be here. Awesome. Let's let's have a little bit of uh, background, uh, if we could, just on you, and and then we'll kind of roll into our larger discussion. Uh, thanks. Um, first, it, this is exciting. I love listening to your show, and um, when we talked about it, I I'm going like I, I'm not the same. I don't seem to fit the typical mold of the types of people you bring on. I'm, I'm probably a bit older on average th than the average guy. But anyhow, because I've, I've got four grown daughters, three are married. I've got a grandchild. And so that's wonderful. I've been married to Lisa. Sorry, long enough that it's like 38 years, I think. We haven't hit 40 yet. I know that. Congrats. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. And she is the love of my life. And um, it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, we feel, I feel like I fall in love with her a little bit more every day. Um, oops, there's a floaty in, my, in the air. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, from way of background, I come from a really, what I would call a traditional background of, I did really well in high school, went into college and then went to graduate school and ended up with a master's of international management. I focused on international and I spent a lot of my career at large corporations of so people who would recognize Morgan Stanley, Kodak. Um, maybe some of them would recognize I Omega, but a lot of people know what a zip drive is. That's the manufacturer of the zip drive, mm. uh, Seagate. So these are big tech companies that I worked at. And, um, and I spent way too much time and effort, um, and not enough personal time when I was younger. Um, and I finally got laid off for the second or third time. And I said, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to go do some consulting. And so I started working with small businesses and I've taken large business strategies and applied them to small businesses. And that's what I love doing. That's what I'm passionate about is helping small businesses succeed specifically in two areas. One is cash flow, which is meaning you've got enough cash to run and grow your business. And number two is profitability. Hmm. There's not enough emphasis put on profitability on cash flow way too much emphasis put on to sales i'm i'm really interested in applying those two ideas to the house and so maybe we can workshop this a little bit so yep. what would cash flow as the concept be for the house so it's really simple it's the whether it's business or the house it's you look at your cash balance in your bank accounts at the beginning of a time period versus mm -hmm. the end of ending of the time period. If it's positive, you have positive cash flow. If it's negative, you have negative cash flow. This year is coming to an end. We're recording this in mid December and I keep track. That's how I run my household. And I know I'll be down about $2,000 in cash for the year. We've had some extraordinary expenses for different reasons. And we say, wow, this is great. We're only down $2,000, but we still know how much cash we have and we mm. track it. Now, week to week, it could be up, it could be down, month to month, it could be up, it could be down, but it's a difference between two time periods. That's your cash flow. So, and we're talking about the time periods. I'm glad you said the weekly, monthly, annually. I know for, um, I know for, for my habits, I typically do an end of month review. And mm -hmm. I, like, I have like nerd wallet. So nerd wallet does a lot of the heavy lifting for me, but I right. also do like a net worth calculator, which catalogs all the things that would contribute to this number, including debts and wealth and assets. And yep, that's the list and all the different areas of what they look like. So that at the end of the day, I have a number that also, it's not really the cash flow, but it's my net worth number. And I do that on both. Actually, I only do that on monthly. 
And then uh, I guess I haven't thought about doing anything like a growth metric of that for the annual, but that's, that's really interesting to take all the reports of the year and, and, and have that, that end of year report. That is interesting. And um, it gives you an idea of how you're doing, but let me caution about net worth versus really what's truly cash flow. And to me, cash flow is how much literal cash can I get my hands on to pay mm. for things? Mm. I do the same with a net worth. I, I maybe update that twice a year, right? Because it involves my house, which has got a lot of equity in it. It's my retirement stuff. Um, the only debt I've got right now is my house. Um, but the challenge of only uh, looking at net worth versus cash flow or how much cash you have is you could be upside down with cash. You, you could have like zero dollars in your bank account and have a huge net worth. It happens all the time. Mm. When the recession hit in 2006, 2008, the people that I knew that went bankrupt and lost their houses lived in the biggest, fanciest street in the neighborhood. Mm. They had wealth. They didn't have cash. Hmm. So that's a cautionary tale. What? Uh, I love that. So let's very specifically, before we get to profitability, let's yeah. very specifically outline at a high level what are the five to 10 numbers that go into a cash flow statement? So if I were to, or if our feel good fathers were to listen, our, our, fa- our feel good community mm-hmm. as well were to listen and say, oh, if I track these every month and then I track it once annually, that I'm managing my cash flow, what, are, what would those numbers be? All right. So let me first make a suggestion. Very few people get paid once a month and spend all their money once a month. For the most part, people are getting paid weekly, bi-weekly, or twice a month. And they spend money continually. So doing a monthly look, and I used to do it like this. I used to use Quicken. It was a monthly budget. I was still in the middle of doo-doo in the middle of the month because we didn't block it off. Um, we really couldn't see the ups and downs. So I would recommend to get started, you do it by week. I do a weekly cash flow. I don't look at it every week. But it tells me which weeks that I'm going to be low and I have to move expenses out or try to bring revenue in. And that's critical to managing your cash flow and to not have shortfalls. And, this is uh, this is super related to a concept you were talking about because yeah. I know that a, a decent number of our listeners are going to be in what I would call the employee world. So they may or may not have the mm-hmm. capability of increasing their income or increasing their revenue if they were in some right. sort of sales capacity. So if you were on a salaried basis, that's sort of like fixed income, you're getting paid twice a month, first 15th, mm-hmm. something like that. Right. So- you're suggesting, would it be better for them to run it by the like first paycheck, what gets taken out of the first paycheck, what's going to take out of the second paycheck, or let's, let's continue to deconstruct yeah. this. So, so that would be great. If you're getting paid twice a month or every other week, those are the two most common, right? Um, 26 pay periods versus 24. That's another way you could do it. Now, I do it weekly because I move excess cash out of my checking account into my savings account so it can earn interest. So that's a little tip, um, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, But let's so every other week, generally, um, you are getting paid every other week, but generally, expenses all accumulate towards the beginning of the month or towards the end of the month. And by mapping this out, you'll be able to see how much cash has to roll over from your second paycheck and be maintained into the first part of the month. Mm. Or even better yet, which is what I recommend, is get rid of the struggles and move expenses to the middle of the month. So they coincide with your paychecks. And um, this is easier to do when you get paid twice a month on the 1st and the 15th. Um, 
it, it it's it, it's okay. It, the the point is you don't accumulate all of your expenses. Whether it's the telephone bill can be moved, your credit card bills can be moved, your um any kind of debt payments like a car loan can be moved. The one thing that can't really be moved is house payments. If you've got a mortgage or on a condo or something, forget about it. It's intractable. And even if they'd let you, they'd probably make you refinance it, which is expensive. So fine, it's an anchor. But move things out from there. And that's generally the biggest, biggest expense. So you can use a simple what's called a ledger paper. If you're not a spreadsheet person, if you're a spreadsheet person, follow along. But I'm going to assume there's certain people out there who need paper. The first number you put in is the beginning balance on Monday morning, which is the same balance as Friday evening. But so Monday morning, that's your beginning balance. Then you list all of your income. That, I, I'm going to I, I'm going to interject here just a little bit. Yeah. Beginning balance for just in case oh. you may not know, that's the amount of cash that's in your bank account. And we're probably talking about your checking account, given that it's cash coming in. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'll go slower. I. It's okay. <laughs> I've got what's called the, I call it the expert's dilemma, which is that somebody who knows stuff so quickly they forget about explaining details. All right. So what we're really looking at is all of your cash that you have available to spend, including emergency cash, right? Because so I, I love Dave Ramsey. You and I have talked about Dave Ramsey. The reason he still has a job 20 years later, 30 years later is because people still have issues um, with cash. Uh, seriously, the, the emergency cash in your house, if you um, if not familiar with that, get emergency cash. He recommends $1,000. And I can testify that ever since we've had $1,000 of emergency cash in the house, we have not had cash emergencies. Mm. There's just this paradox. And he'll, if you haven't heard of Dave Ramsey, I think, Jay, is it fair to say that you'd recommend listening to that, him as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Check out uh, okay. uh, Seven Baby Steps. Uh, I, he's anywhere you, anywhere you go for a financial education, you're going to get the debt pay down, like the, it's the debt avalanche snowball. and snowball yeah. method and, and yep. that kind of stuff. Um, it's a, it's a, one of my favorite lessons from him was, is this, and I think this is the, the, the trick to managing your finances is that he says, everybody thinks that they're ahead of the curve. And if you think of life in the population at large, there's going to be a small percentage of people on a bell curve that manage their money very well. And there's a small percentage of people at the bottom end that manage it incredibly poorly. And then there's sort of like everybody. And the thing is, is that most people think that they, that they're ahead and that they manage your money very well. And he says, odds are you're actually on the bell curve. You're not at either ends. So odds are you're not able to beat the game. Odds are you're not good at managing the points. Odds are you're not good at paying off your credit. Odds are you're not good at, at some of these other habits in the financial world. So just get rid of it. Don't play that game and then pay cash. So that's kind of like a high level of, of what I thought was a really significant. Um, lesson from him. Well, and so, and, and I've already mentioned my favorite lesson is the cash it reserve in the house. Mm -hmm. We stopped having cash emergencies once we did that. That's and we awesome. Very, very rarely dip into it. it mm. There's there's some kind of a natural law that says if you're prepared, you won't need to use it. If you're not prepared, that's when you need it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um. So going back to a simple, how do you figure this out? You start with how much cash, which would be in your savings account, how much would be in your checking account. We are not talking about true emergency cash, which would be in like um, retirement, et cetera. That's not cash. Set that aside. You're not spending that. If it was a true emergency, somebody gets sick, you can think of reasons you'd cash that out. but. We're sure. not talking about that. Okay. So you start out with how much is in those accounts. Let's just say you've got a banking, a bank account, a savings account, and your emergency cash. So that's your beginning balance. Except, so that's your total. But now we're just going to talk about the checking account. Okay. Your beginning balance in your checking account, which is where you spend money from, mm -hmm. that's 
again, think about writing it down on a piece of paper, doing a spreadsheet. That's your first number. Then you list your income. Now, again, for most people, that means that they've got a W-2, they've got a paycheck, and they might have no other income. But there might be people listening that have child support coming in. There might be people come, who um, are listening that have got regular payments coming in from some other source. So you should include those. And unless it's going straight to savings, then don't include it. But assuming that you're spending it, it's part of your spending habits. Whatever's coming in, add that up, and that's how much money you have available to spend. Mm. The next thing is hopefully you're in a savings habit, and we're not really here to talk about that, but hopefully you've got a savings habit and you're moving money to savings. But let's just call that as part of your expenses. Okay. You list out all of your expenses, which for that time period, and again, we're going to talk about two weeks. If you want to, put into one week. But do you have grocery expenses every week? Most people do. Mm. Do you have gasoline expenses every week? Most people do. Medical expenses? Yep, something, aspirin or something's going to come along. So you list out all your expenses. And this is probably the most difficult part is saying, what are my expenses going to be? Because if you haven't mm. been keeping track, you don't know that, on average, you spend, oh, let's just call it $150 a week for your family on groceries. And so it's going to be a guessing game at first if you haven't kept track of this. But most people have a gut idea, and some will be a little high, some will be a little bit low. Just give it your best effort. List out all of your expenses. Do you have car insurance that's coming due? Do you know your due dates on everything? When's the net Netflix bill come in? All these automated transactions we've got going these days. Um, add those all, list them all out, add that up, and subtract your amount that you have to spend versus the amount, the, the amount available to spend versus your expenses during that time period and see, hopefully, you've got more available to spend than money that has to go out because you'll be left with a positive balance. Got it. If it's negative and you don't have enough money in the checking account after that time frame, then you have to make a decision how you're going to manage your money. So that part one is modeling, and I'm going to keep going in for one more step, and then we'll talk about managing your money a little bit. So then that ending projected bank balance then becomes the starting bank balance mm -hmm. at the beginning of the next period. And for those, Got it. I, I'm, so it just goes from the, from the bottom, to the top of the next column. And you repeat for every time period. Got it. And, and we started with this on the weekly. So, right. so you let's would say do it's this. The first, first of the month, right? That you get paid the first and the 15th. So this is the first of the month beginning what do you project out will be your ending balance at the end of the day on the 14th of the month. That would be your beginning balance on the 15th of the month. Got it. Got it. Okay. That's great. So we've got the starting. So it's your cash minus your expenses. And that gives you your cash flow. And the difference between the two is your cash flow. Correct. Got it. For okay. that two week period. Awesome. So now you, you mentioned um, some money management techniques. Yes. So there's two possible scenari scenarios. Well, three, sorry. Let's take the worst case scenario. That is, you don't have a positive bank balance at the end of those two weeks. That you're, you literally are going, wow, I'm going to be underwater. So here's the good news. You just figured out you're going to be underwater. And you're not going to get blindsided, which happens to way too many people, right? Yeah. It, it, all of a sudden, you get these notices from your bank, you're overdrawn, or you've got an overdraft, and they're charging you $35 for something that costs them nothing to do. So you want to be able to project that out and then do something about it. So what can you do? If you have savings, you can transfer money into savings. Uh, sorry, from savings into 
your checking account to be able to cover the shortfall. Now, I like to keep, and I'll just, I'll be as transparent as I can be. I like to keep a projected $400 in my checking account. So that ending balance is $400. Now, usually it ends up being more. I'm very conservative. I generally underestimate revenue, overestimate expenses, and then I end up with a lot more money at the, in the bank, in the checking account. And Got I it. don't worry about the minuscule amounts of money I'm lo losing from savings. Got it. But you might, we start out with less. We just wanted $100. And we moved it up to 200 and 300 to have excess in that we just feel secure, that we, we don't have to worry about it. And so what we're saying here is that when you're starting out, don't aim for something that's not feasible. Just start with something that you know you can manage. Yep. And then over time, as you increase your income, as your expenses increases, as your savings increases, you can aim for, you can play the game. So yep. as in, in, the game, in the game world, right, we want to increase our score. So we're treating this cash flow game as the score, I'm trying to maximize that score, by meaning that we're trying to increase it. You know, um, Jay knows that I've trademarked the term winning the cash flow game. I'll do something with that down the road. Um, but it's true. And it's the same thing for anybody who heard us talking about getting $1,000 emergency funds going, that's impossible. Fine. Start with $50 and then move up to 75, then 100. And you'll find that you can accumulate it over time. So- I, I'm Really yeah. interesting phenomena I found with that was at, uh, and I still to this day, I keep at least a hundred bucks in my wallet. And it, it initially it was like, oh, I have all this cash in my wallet. But now it's like, uh, it's, it changes my relationship with what's on my body. It changes my relationship with how I'm thinking about cash. And so having that cash in there, um, it makes me think differently about the the bank account. And so I'm not always dipping into a card or I'm not always dipping into something else to pay for something. Um, and having that cash really works very well. So I think a lot of this, a lot of this, and I, I, I mostly think about this from the game design perspective, a lot of the value that we place in an object has to do with like its, its proximity and its use. And so uh, most of us today, unfortunately, are thinking about money in a virtual um, intangible sense. It's an mm -hmm. abstract number that I never see. Whereas even when I started, it was like, there were no direct deposits. I was handed a paper check and I had to go to the bank to deposit my paper check. And so there was always a trail. I was always signing when I was young. Um, I'm sure that you had a, a similar ex uh, experience. Mm -hmm. So money was very tangible to me. And like, even when I grew up, like when my first couple of jobs, I didn't have the cards. I didn't have a credit card for a while. So everything was like, oh, I'm going out tonight. I got to go, I got to go hit the ATM. Right. <laughs> I got to go, got to go get the cash out. And so my experience is going to be very, uh, with money and your experience is going to be super different from our kids' experience, which I think is something that, uh, you know, for the feel good fatherhood and the feel good community that we want to talk about. It's like more and more of our cash, especially when you're talking about crypto, is going into this, these virtual environments. You're never touching it. Yeah. And I don't necessarily think it's a good thing. I don't keep a hundred dollars with me. It's more like 20 to 40. Well, part of it is you never know when you're going to need cash. I was just talking to Lisa, my wife and business partner this morning said, remember that time we were in Queen, in Brooklyn, New York, really nice Italian restaurant. I go to pay with my card and they said, Oh no, we only take cash. It was like, Okay, and it wasn't a great neighborhood. It was late at night. I had to go find an ATM machine. Mm -hmm. That was my lesson to always carry cash. Mm -hmm. Now, I suspect it was run by um, organized crime. that They wanted the cash, but sure. who cares? I mean, that's not the point. The point is they would have broken my legs if I didn't have cash. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what they would have done. <clears throat> Yeah, it's, it's a good thing. And, you know, it's Jay, this is what um, I teach a lot about is accounting. We're, we're not really here to talk about business side of things, but accounting is virtual in its own sense. There's all these made up numbers that aren't real, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to what's called accrual accounting. But even cash based accounting, there's stuff that it's just fantasies that was made up and it's theoretical. And for us as individuals, we want to deal with the practical realities. 
of what our money is doing. Mm. And if somebody out is out there struggling, and let me tell you, I've struggled with cash and with our cash flow because I was earning what well, there's a euphemism. I had more uh, days than paycheck, right? You run out of money and mm -hmm. we were living, we were really tight. And it wasn't until we switched over to literally tracking where our cash was coming from and where it was going that we really got a handle on things mm. because all the software I was using that was best in class did it by month. So we were budgeting by month, but we didn't get paid that way. We didn't mm. spend by month. And it was all these monthly budgets. And we're like, wait a minute, we just ran out. We're theoretically, we're supposed to have enough. Well, yeah, when we get paid next week, we'll have enough for the month, but we don't need it in two weeks. We need it now. Mm. It's it's super interesting because I know I, I'm I'm guessing and I'm knowing that we're going to move into cash management when the balance is positive, and so we're going to get into what actual cash management means, which is you have cash and you're appropriating it to different areas of your life. Uh, so I think because I think this is going to be very related to that piece. So let's let's move on. So we had the negative. We're transferring from savings. We're getting right. cash right. Right. to so spend. That's one right. Way. Oh, sorry. Thank yeah. you. Get get me back on track. So the yeah. second possibility when you don't have enough cash is you start managing and the the only thing you really can manage is pushing out now um somebody might be tempted to go get a payday loan avoid it at all costs yeah you we see this in the business world there's equivalent of bank uh payday loans but don't do that don't go get a cash for title loan if you've got a title on your car Go get a bank loan against your car if you need the money mm. and you've got good enough credit. Anyhow, let's get away from that. Back to manage your cash. Look at your bills. Which ones can be paid late? Now, when I say paid late, I'm first talking about paid late without a penalty. Almost every single large company doesn't care that you pay up to 15 to 30 days late. You start with your biggest bill, which is your mortgage. You've got to read the fine print. Because it's mm. a big penalty if you pay late. Um, it'll hit your credit if you pay too late. But most mortgages I've worked with are okay. They're due on the first. And there's no penalty if you pay as late as the 15th of the month. Mm. And so you can pay late. Now, some people have grown up with, no, that's dishonest. That's not fair to the my vendors. It's like, okay, you don't, I'm not saying you want to do this. But you're trying to take care of your family first. And these are big companies who are not going to think twice about shutting you down if you run into problems. So mm. it's okay if you take your phone bill and pay it 20 days late. or And you've got to check into bill by bill. I'm making blanket statements here. You might have a phone that if you don't pay it on the exactly when it's due, they're going to cut you off. So I've got to give you that caveat and for everything else I'm taking, going to be talking about. But I've done this with phone bills, utility bills, mortgages, um, uh, car payments, um, the one thing you cannot delay are automatic withdrawals. And I hate them. And I only use them when I have to. Why? Because I give my control of my cash to a nameless, faceless company. And mm. it's next to impossible to call them up and say, listen, I don't have enough money in the bank account. Can you delay taking the money out? Mm. They won't let you do it. And so I minimize that. And, I, and I've got friends who go, no, just you should leave it alone. It makes it so much easier in life. Well, I'm still shell-shocked from when I didn't have enough cash. Got so it. I don't like to do automatic payments. That's what we're number one. Number two is you heard of the term set it and forget it. That's supposed to be a good thing. That's a sales pitch, right? Hey, just set it and forget it. Well, unfortunately, that's what a lot of these people who do automatic billing want you to do. You, they want you to forget about it. So if you're not keeping track, you will all of a sudden find out that your phone bill has gone up, your, um, your cable bill has gone up, your Netflix. I mean, all of these services are going up. And Lisa and I all of a sudden are going, wait a minute. We never paid more than $20 for cable because we didn't subscribe to the, we need a hundred channels. And all of a sudden we're paying 40 or 50 or $60 a month for Disney and Netflix because they all went up. 
Mm. And so you don't want to set it and forget it. This is another strategy is look at your bills every month. Not only that, but mistakes happen, right? So I'm getting away from what you do about it. These are other strategies. So I think, I think on, on this particular piece, what, yeah. what you're saying is we, we started with the premise that when you're calculating your cash flow, you want to know where it's coming in and where it's going out. Mm-hmm. And what you're saying is missing that every month and doing a set and forgetting it is you're not appropriately managing the expenses that are coming into the house. Yes. And then I, I know because I've read the book um, by Ramit uh, Sethke, uh, I Will Teach You to Be Rich, that that one and then online at, at tons of different places, they actually have scripts and strategies to call up these companies and reduce the fee or get things in exchange or delay these things. So there are places out there where you can figure out how to adjust these expenses, sometimes getting a discount, sometimes delaying them, as you were saying. Um, but I think, I think here we've gotten, I think we have a good concept here of like, all right, managing your bills, right? So there's managing your bills and then we get cash from our, from our reserves in, in some capacity to, uh, or we adjust the bill dates to, to manage the cashes in the checking account. So let's move on to like, other scenarios in the cash management stage. So is there a neutral stage? Where you're basically staying even? Yeah. Um, yes, but it's very unlikely because almost nobody has this exact same expenses. You might have the exact same income every month, every two weeks, but expenses will almost always vary. Got it. So how about positive? How about for positive um, cash flow, cash management? So uh, on the positive cash management side, it's really a matter of spending less than you make, which is a hard lesson for a lot of people. Um, And I'm not including myself and my wife that we, we are very optimistic. I made a lot of money, but at the same time, if, if anybody wants uh, to have a really good insight, um, Read The Millionaire Next Door. It talks about millionaires are not who you think they are. They're fundamentally people who have good offense, which is earning money, but really, really good defense, which is not spending money. Mm. And and it's a gap of the, the difference between the two and setting it aside and accumulating wealth. Mm. Okay. So what else? So what setting aside, accumulating... Mm-hmm. Great stuff. Love doing it. So we've got positive. What are some, what are some, some tactics that are some strategies that you've seen employed? To accumulate wealth? Uh, or, well, once you have your, pa- like we're still in cash management. So when you have your management. positive amount, like oh. what are you doing with it? What are you doing with okay. your cash? So to be able to increase your cash management. Okay. You increase your cash flow. So one is simply having a, a savings account. And okay. or um, a money market fund or something like that. So uh, there's like layers. Checking, you got to spend right now. And then you can have a, a cash reserve at your bank. Banks are notorious for paying really bad interest. Okay. But you go to a third party like a Fidelity or a Charles Schwab. They've generally got money market funds that are 10x what you can get at the bank. And so that's a third layer of accumulation. And I'm talking about cash reserves that you're not investing. You're just putting out there, earning a steady interest rate. So if you need it, you can come get it. Oh, okay. I, I hadn't heard about that, the money market funds. I'm going to go do some research after this. That's, that's kind of cool. What else? Um, okay. So that's one. Number two is we've already talked about scrubbing your expenses. Take a look at your expenses and not only what you're paying, but how you're paying. There's mm-hmm. certain things you might want to, um, it's very subjective. For example, I switched off of my cell phone carrier years ago. It was a disaster. I was back within a couple months and I've tried it again. I was back within a couple months. It's not the cheapest one out there. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I, I need the service. I, I use it for my business and I can't deal with the unreliability. Okay, But there's some people out there who might be saying, you know what, I need to shop around for cell phone service because I can reduce by hundreds of dollars a month 
by switching. The same thing with auto insurance. We get into these ruts where it's easier to just let it go. Mm. And as opposed to shopping around on a regular basis, once a year, once every other year, mix it mm. up and saying, what am I spending my money at and how I'm spending it? Now that's one. Number two is how are you paying for it? So um, I've already told you that I don't like automatic bill payments. But on the other hand, there's certain things I, I don't want to risk getting cut off, my cable bill and my telephone, right? And in the past, I've made mistakes. <laughs> and, it's the, and it's just scrambling going, what do you mean? I, I, you know, the, all of a sudden the phone's turned off. You know, this is a couple decades ago, but I've lived sure. through it and I never want to repeat it. That's automatic. But I also look at the bill every month. And if it's more than it should be, I go figure out why. Okay. Um, but there's certain things that if you pay on an annual basis, it is less expensive. In particular, insurance. They will quote you either an annual amount or they will quote you a monthly amount. Uh, either way, they'll let you pay generally, annually, semi-annually, quarterly, and monthly. The more frequent, frequently you pay, the more your insurance costs. And so as you're accumulating cash, hmm. it is great to pay for insurance once a year. This is a general statement. There may be exceptions out there. And you might have to go from, okay, I can't do it annually, but I'll go to quarterly. But what that requires is you build up money in a cash reserve so it's accumulated there so you can spend it once a year. I got it. And, and so I think that the thing, what I'm really reflecting on here is that we're truly managing the cash that's coming in and going out of the helm. Yep. That, that these techniques are really about making sure that at the end of that week, like or on that Monday review, that there's more cash in your account. That's that's the purpose of doing all this stuff. So I, I like I like the you've, effort. This is really yep, cool. You've got a positive balance that you, it, it'll yeah. fluctuate up and down, Jay. But that the, the that's the goal. That's how you win the game. Is your bank account balances checking account is always greater than zero. <laughs> got it. And we're not. And 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 to be clear, this is about making sure the checking account balance is always greater than zero. We're not talking about investing. We're not talking about that kind of stuff. We're just talking right. about what's the number in the account that's going to pay the bills, keep the lights on, keep food on the table, yep. allow us to go to restaurants, that kind of jazz. Yep, absolutely. But let me let me go into a little bit more advanced, right? Um, we, we decided we needed to redo our porch. And okay. um, we finally found a way to do it relatively uh, cost effectively. But it was still going to cost us, let's just say, $3,000. It's roughly the right amount. And at first, we were like, okay, we're going to have to take it out of savings. Then I said, well, let me play with some stuff. Because it was in two parts. One was a deposit. And it wasn't going to be done for six weeks. And, um, and then, yeah, six weeks. Then we had to pay for the second part. Let me see if we put it on our credit card. Now, let me give you a caution. Credit cards are dangerous. I've run into trouble with credit cards. All right. We use credit cards. We pay them off every single month. <laughs> Their interest rates are too high, but you can use them to your advantage. Okay. And this is one of the ways we did it. We put the deposit on a credit card. We then accumulated cash in our savings account because we live below our means. And so when that card came due, we were able to pay it off and then pay off the second round. So it was a total of like three or four months that we were able to take it out of cash flow instead of dipping into more of our long-term savings. And and were you putting it into like an like an interest fund to do that? Like so you were earning interest while you were delaying this or yes. So again, I we've got three. We've got our checking account, we've got our savings account, which is in the same bank, and then we we use fidelity. Sure. So we didn't want to hit the Fidelity account, which is earning 5%. We said, we'll accumulate it in the checking account. Uh, sorry, in the savings account. And then we pay for it out of the checking account when the bill comes due. Mm. 
So okay. there's a psychological part. You know, so much of this is mindset. We've we've yet to use that word, but sure. so much of what we're talking about today is how you think about this. And one of the psychologies, if you move it out of your checking account into a savings account, you stop thinking it's available to spend. Yes. It's much, much easier to think about it like that. And we'll have discussions of what do you want me to do with this? At least like, get it out of the checking account. Then I won't think I have money to spend it. I'm the same way. Most people are. And then it's the, even that less spendable when it's not in the same bank. There was a, there was an, a, a, I love that, that friction on getting them between different institutions. There was this old bank. I, I loved working with it. It was called Simple. And they had, what they had was a safe to spend number. So they did a lot of what you were talking about. It was, it was banking based on cash management. And so what they would do is you would set your bills in. And I think, I think it did kind of do cash management on a monthly basis, but you could say, these are my monthly bills. And then it would show your checking balance mm -hmm. as your cash minus your expenses. So if you had three, if you had, if you made $5,000 in a month, and you had three thousand dollars worth of expenses, you could never see more than two thousand per month of cash because it was hidden. It was always available. You could access right. it with a simple card, but it would show it was a safe to spend number. So it only showed what was above your expenses for the month. And I thought it was an ingenious way to just make sure that, like, okay, like I know everything's gonna get paid no matter what. However, I've got this number that's this is what I can spend. And I, yeah. and I haven't found an institution that's done anything like that since. And, um, the, the, the best way that I've done cash management at that stage is having multiple, just, just multiple accounts. Right. Because then all of a sudden that's how much money you've got left to spend, right? Yeah. You've, you've pay your bills out of there and then there's groceries, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I used to use Quicken, which was made by Intuit. And I would do that. I would, um, pre spend things for a and so it didn't show up in my balance when I looked at it. There's mm. different mental tricks. And you know something, Jay, one of the things that I think both of us can agree on, just the way you're talking, this is not an overnight thing. Mm -mm. Getting control of your money, it's taken us years. It's years where, to the point where I can go for a couple of weeks without looking at my cash flow because we're just in enough control. But um, Nobody, sh everybody should be easy on themselves. So if there's somebody listening today that's possibly facing bankruptcy or somebody out there listening today that feels like they're just spiraling downward, know that you can do this. It is possible. And no, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. But if you take baby steps, which is this Dave Ramsey concept, um, but it's also the, what about Bob, which is a great Bill Murray movie. Mm -hmm. um, if you take some small steps, you can get there and just keep trying to take more and more steps in a day and you can do it. You really can. Awesome. And I thank you so much for that. We appreciate it. You know, we're all about hope here. So David, if folks want to get a hold of you, uh, like who are they? We'll start with that. And then where can they find you? Um, who is the typical person that I work with? You mean? Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. I work with accountants and bookkeepers. I do not do personal financial planning. Um, so please don't call me because I'll have to do a disclaimer. I, I actually help somebody, but they, they had businesses that they were running and they were ha running into a problem yesterday. And it was wrapped into the personal planning. I can't do it. I'm not licensed. I'd, I'd love to help people. I work with accountants and bookkeepers who want to learn how to help their companies improve their future. The discussion we've had today about personal finance, I can have all day long about business finances also and using mm -hmm. cash principles to help improve a business's future. Awesome. And, and it's easy to reach me. Um, you can reach me at my um, email, david at davidsafir.com or at my website, davidsafir.com. Or I'm going to give you my phone number. How about we do, um, how about we do your, uh, the website cashisclear.com? Oh yeah, cashisclear.com. Absolutely. 
Sorry, I'm in transition. We're moving over to catch us clear. <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah. So, no, I won't give you my phone number. You can look me up on LinkedIn if you really want it. It's out there in the public sphere, sphere and nobody's called me yet. And I'm really disappointed. I wish somebody would call me. <laughs> and you can find that number on LinkedIn. Now, that's D A V I D S A F E E R dot com for the uh for those of us that are listening david thank you so much for talking to us about your expertise really appreciate it thank you jay it was great being here